Welcome to the wider annual lecture 25 to be provided by Binar Agarwal on women's struggle for land in South Asia. Can legal reforms trump social norms? I'm Kunal Sen, the director of UNI wider, and I'm chairing the, the annual lecture today. I would first like to introduce those of you who have been new to a UNI wider event to the to the United Nations University and to UNU wider. The United Nations University was established in 1975 to act as a research arm of the, of the United Nations. There are now 14 institutes located in 12 countries around the world. But it was UNU wider, the World Institute for Development Economics Research, that was the first research institute of the university back in 1985. Today, UNU wider serves as a unique blend of a think tank, research institute, and a UN agency based in Helsinki, Finland. This event is our 25th annual lecture, so effectively our silver anniversary. The lectures have been delivered by a prestigious line of scholars and policymakers, four of whom are Nobel laureates. It's a pleasure to welcome Binagar Wal to that lineup. Today's lecture will be, will be run for approximately 45 minutes, followed by discussion of Sakiko Fukuda Par. Afterwards, I'll return to chair the Q&A for approximately 10 minutes, for 30 minutes, approximately, sorry, apologies. I would now like to introduce the wider annual lecture for 2021. Bina Agrawal is Professor of Development Economics and Environment at the Global Development Institute, University of Manchester, UK. Prior to this, she was Director and Professor of Economics at the Institute of Economic Growth, Delhi University, where she continues to be affiliated. Educated at the University of Cambridge and Delhi, she has held distinguished uh, teaching research positions at many universities, including Harvard, Princeton, Michigan, Minnesota, and the New York University School of Law. Bina Agua's research contributions cover both theory and empirical analysis, with a particular focus on the most disadvantaged. An economist with a keen interest in interdisciplinary and inter-country explorations, her publications include 12 books and over 80 academic papers. She writes especially from political economy and gender perspective on diverse but interconnected subjects, such as property, land rights and livelihoods, environmental governance, sustainable development and collective action, agriculture, technology, and food security, poverty institutional transformation, legal change, and intersecting inequalities. Her pioneering work on gender inequality in property and land, as well as on environmental issues, has had global impact. Among her best known works is a field of one's own, Gender and Land Rights in South Asia, Cambridge University Press 1994, which was awarded the A.K. Kurosami Book Prize 1996 and the Edward Graham Book Prize 1996. Binagawal has been president of the International Society of Ecological Economics, vice president of the International Economic Association, and president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. In 2008, Binagawal was honored with the Padma Sri by the government of India for her contributions to education. In 2010, she received the Leontief Prize from Tufts University, Tufts University for advancing the frontiers of economic thought. She's also been awarded the Order of Agriculture Merit by the Government of France in 2016. And in 2017, she was awarded the Agriponis Louis Malasis International Scientific Prize for an outstanding career in agriculture development, as well as the prestigious International Balsam Prize. I would like to also welcome the discussant, Sakiko Fukuda Par who is Professor of International Affairs at the New School in New York and serves as the Director of the Julian Studley Graduate Programs in International Affairs. She also co-directs the Collective, the Political Determinants of Health at the University of Oslo. Sakigo so Fukuda Pa's recent research focuses on the politics of SDGs and the indicators. From 1995 to 2004, she led the UNDP Human Development Reports. She serves on several boards, global committees and NGO networks advocating for human rights and inclusive development, including the UN Committee on Development Policy, UN High-Level Panel Access to Medicines and, and Innovation, Knowledge Ecology International, amongst others. In the annual lecture, Binagawa will speak about women's struggle for equality and rights to property. Women represent over 40% of the agricultural labor force. Yet they rarely all own land that they're working on, have tenure securities or control over the land. Women's right to land and property is central to women's economic empowerment. As land is a base for food production and income generation, as collateral for credit, and as a means for holding savings for the future. In India, legal reforms have given a vast majority of women 
legal equality with men in the, in the country. And the rights in neighboring countries, Nepal, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, have also increased. Have changes in the law improved women's situation in practice? Have they closed the gender gap in actual land ownership and trumped restrictive social norms and customs? If not, is there a way forward? Vinay Agarwal addresses these questions in the 2021 White Annual Lecture, drawing on her three decades of research on the subject. I would now like to invite Vinay Agarwal to deliver the White Annual Lecture 25. Vinay, over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's a great honor to be asked to deliver the 25th wider annual lecture. Um, and I am uh, I warmly thank uh, Professor Kunal Sen for inviting me and for that uh, lovely introduction. I also congratulate him for his many new initiatives when he took over as uh, head of uh, wider and for extending the reach of wider globally. I would like to also thank Ruby Richardson and her wonderful team for their very hard work on communications and logistics over the last few months. And I'm very pleased that Professor Sekiko Fukuda Par, uh, who's a long-standing colleague and friend, will be commenting uh, today. And I very much look forward to her comments. So almost a century has passed since women in South Asia first raised a demand for equal rights in property, especially land. Most, this is the most important productive uh, property in developing economies. And over time, this struggle broadened and diversified. Now, despite resistance uh, from conservative lawmakers, uh, this led to notable legal reforms. As a result, most Indian women today enjoy legal equality with men in their inheritance rights. Women's legal rights have also expanded greatly in neighboring Nepal, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. But has it changed ground reality? Have legal reforms helped bridge the gender gap in land ownership? Have they trumped restrictive social norms? If not, what are the ways forward? So these are the questions that I will address today. Now, in the 1930s, newly formed national women's organizations in undivided India, which was then under British colonial rule, raised rights in property as a key demand, partly for its own sake and partly since the right to vote and to stand for elections was linked to owning property. So you can see uh, some of the pictures um, of the uh, All India Women's Conference, the uh, Women's India Association here, and also the um, the women members of the Constituent Assembly. Um, across religious lines, women's groups formed committees, they studied the law, they spoke to lawyers, they published pamphlets about women's position, and they encouraged legislation to enhance women's status. They were supported by liberal male legislators, and these efforts bore some fruit. Initially in 1937, for both Hindu and Muslim women, with some increase in the rights of widows for Hindus and later only for Hindu women with the drafting of the Hindu Code Bill in 1942, which among other things sought to enhance the rights of daughters in inheritance. However, the, as you can imagine, the bill was subject to heated debate when it was introduced in the Constituent Assembly of Independent India in 1948, with mixed responses from male legislators. So, for example, during the Constituent Assembly debates and parliamentary debates in the late 1940s and early 50s, one Congress legislator asked, are you going to enact a code that will facilitate the breaking up of our households? Another argued that giving property shares to daughters would spell nothing but disaster. And yet another said that if daughters inherited property, they would choose not to marry at all, crying out, May God save us from an army of unmarried women. And as you can see from this um, 1948 uh, a cartoon, newspapers had uh, a field day playing this up. In the end, however, following delays and compromises, the progressive prevailed, and especially uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, um, and, uh, who was a major figure in the drafting of India's constitution, and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister. And the Hindu Succession Act of 1956 was passed. 
Although still gender unequal, it shifted women's property rights from a position of gross inequality to a fair degree of equality for over 80% of Indian women. So what was the shift? Now, overall, we need to keep in mind uh, that the inheritance systems in South Asia are very complex. They vary by religion, by region and type of property, and land is treated differently from movable property. And this has been always the case, even if you go back to the Dharma Shastras. Now, Hindu inheritance law has particular complexities. Most Hindus fall under the uh, purview of the 12th century Mitakshara system, which distinguishes between a man's separate property, which is self-acquired, and his joint family property, which are held as co personary shares. This is ancestral property. Now, prior to the 1956 Hindu Succession Act, the vast majority of Hindu women could only inherit their father's or their husband's property in the absence of four generations of agnatic males, that is, males in the male line of descent. The 1956 Act gave widows and daughters equal shares with sons and brothers in a man's separate property, interstate, that is, without leaving a will. But only sons had birth rights in joint family property which could not be willed away. And agricultural land was subject to state level tenurial laws, which were highly gender unequal. Now, Village India received news of the 1956 uh, law with alarm. And this was recorded by some anthropologists, um, where they recorded that villagers saw it as a sinister attempt to destroy the family, that it would lead to divorce and intra-family conflicts. Now, this view persisted into the late 1980s. So in 1989, when I made an invited presentation to senior bureaucrats and to cabinet ministers at the Indian Planning Commission, the then Minister of Agriculture exclaimed, are you suggesting that women should be given rights in land? What do women want? To break up the family? Ironically, of course, what this implied was that Indian families are characterized by deep inequalities and would fall apart the moment women had independent rights in property. Nevertheless, the trajectory of legal reform continued. So between 1976 and 1994, uh, what you found was that um, five states in South and West India amended the Hindu Succession Act of 1956. Now, four states uh, did so by bringing in unmarried daughters as co-partners in joint property and Kerala abolished joint family property altogether. And in this map, you can see the southern states uh, where, which amended it partially. But finally, in 2005, following a civil society uh, campaign that I led, the remaining main inequalities in Hindu inheritance law were overcome in both joint family property and farmland. Now, since Hindu law also includes uh, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Jains, this reform legally benefited some 83% of Indian women and girls. Alongside the inheritance laws of Christians and Parsis uh, also moved towards gender equality. So you'll ask, well, what was the legal change in Hindu law between 1956 and 2005? Now, the 2005 Act gave daughters and widows equal rights with sons uh, in a man's separate property and his share of joint property. Interstate, that is without a will. And in the Mitaksha system, sons additionally had direct rights by birth in joint property. That is, they could, it could not be willed away. What the 2005 amendment did was a major advance. It gave daughters the same rights by birth as sons in joint property, including agricultural land. And the main change was thus in rights of joint property, including land. So I want to spend a minute or two to explain this with the help of diagrams. So if you see the, this first diagram, uh, it, uh, it covers the 1956 Hindu Succession Act, and I will focus only on the joint property part of it. Now, here you have, let's say, a granddad has two sons, S1 and S2, and he has 90 uh, acres of land. Uh, but these uh, co personary shares of the three are 30 acres each per stirpes. Um, but S1 has a daughter and a, and a son and, and a wife, while S2 has no family. Now, in S1's uh, 30 acres, he and his son 
have equal share. So each has 15 acres. Plus, when S1 dies, his son, um, his daughter, and his widow get equal shares in his joint property. So each gets five acres each. In total, thus the son gets five acres uh, and plus 8.33, which is his own co-passery share, and they share in the father's co-passery. So together, no, not 3.33, he gets uh, 15 plus five, so he gets 20 acres here. Now, what happens uh, when you, you amend the law? The 2005 amendment, you take the same family, and here you have S1's daughter also becomes a co-partner in joint property. So per stirpiece, the shares of S1 and his son and daughter become 10 acres each. That is the direct co-partner share. But when S1 dies, his 10 acres is divided three ways, which is 3.33 acres. And now the widow gets 3.33. The daughter and son get equal amount, which is 13.33 each. So what this means is that while daughters and sons have become equal, the widow has lost with the amendment. And I think it's really important to remember this because the possibility of creating inequalities between women while advocating equality for men is seldom factored in uh, even uh, within uh, by women's groups. Now, since the 1950s, other countries in South Asia have also uh, seen legal reform. So, in, for instance, in Pakistan, the demands by women's groups led to the passing of the West Pakistan Muslim Personal Law Sharia Application Act in 1962. This increased women's rights, um, including in land, but the prescribed shares were lower than men's as per the Sharia. In Hindu Nepal today, after decades of struggle by women's groups, again, sons and daughters have equal shares in the father's property. While Sri Lanka historically has always been a bit of an outlier, and here women in all religions, even historically, held substantial legal rights in landed property. So across South Asia, women's legal rights have increased, and this is undoubtedly a major step forward. And many would say, well, let's stop at legal change. Even the Sustainable Development Goal 5 of, uh, on gender equality focuses mainly on legal reform, as do many economists. But equality as an idea needs to be embodied not just in the laws, but also in the institutions and practices of everyday life. Where are we in practice after a century of effort? Have we bridged the gap? between de jure and de facto rights? Has actual practice kept pace with legal reform? Now, an answer to this is of critical importance uh, since uh, it is actual ownership which can bring women the expected welfare and efficiency gains um, of owning land that a vast body of empirical work globally shows. So here, um, this is my 1994 book cover, A Field of One's Own. And, uh, there's been a vast amount of return. There was evidence that I presented in the book, but also since then, there's a vast amount of additional evidence which has emerged. So, so for instance, so there is uh, evidence to show that women's ownership of land has welfare uh, improvements, have efficiency improvements, and has empowerment effects apart from the intrinsic worth, worth of equality. So, for instance, child survival, health and education is found to be significantly higher if the mother owns assets than if only the father owns assets. Owning land is also found to greatly reduce women's risk of domestic violence as well as their risk of poverty. Plus, according to the FAO estimates, if women farmers in developing uh, countries had the same access to inputs, including land, um, then their yields could be 20 to 30 percent higher and agricultural growth in developing uh, countries could be 2.4 to 3% greater, and hunger could decline. Now, this will matter increasingly, especially with the feminization of agriculture across the global south. And it would not only help our targets of SDG 5 on gender equality, but also SDG 1 and 2, if you remember, which are on poverty and hunger. So measurement of women's actual ownership of land is essential. But getting gender disaggregated data for assessing the gender gap in ownership has been another uphill struggle across South Asia. So I will share with you some of the figures that I've culled together based on existing evidence, 
we, we, what we find is a very large gender gap in land owned across South Asia, even in Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, whatever the indicator that we can calculate uh, by the uh, data that we have. And as you can see, it's uh, even in Sri Lanka, it's only 30%, but across um, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and, and India, uh, the percent of women landowners is very low. And the percent of landowners who are women is also hugely unequal. Now, but ideally, uh, given the complexity of legal rights, we need to cover both individually owned and co-owned land. And we need to use a range of indicators to assess varied dimensions of inequality, as well as to monitor changes over time. And we also need to assess hitherto ignored intragender variations, uh, since which women acquire land, whether it's as widows or as daughters, can affect the potential benefits, as I've just argued. Now, consider India. Now, none of India's um, major uh, data sources on land, which is the Agricultural Census or the National Sample Survey, disaggregate land owned by gender, nor do the digitized land records. So after my, uh, I, among others, have been advocating for such data for decades. And then more recently, a couple of few years ago, I was alerted that the International Crop Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics, ICRISAT, had begun gender disaggregating data, uh, its, its data on land owned in 2009-10 in India. It was doing it in, in Africa, but not for India. Now, this is panel data for a sample of households in 30 villages over 2010 to 12, uh, 2010 to 14. Initially, it was for eight states and then in 2014 for nine. Now, this enabled me and my two young colleagues to assess intergender gaps in, far, in farmland owned using seven indicators. And we also analyzed uh, uh, differences between women, especially between widows and daughters. So in this slide, um, I will give you, I've given you five indicators for male-female gaps for 2014. And we note that the gaps are huge on all counts. So barely 16% um, of households have any women landowners uh, in our sample. And just 8.4% of all women aged 15 and more own any land. None own any land below the age of 15. Overall, women constitute only 14% of landowners owning 11% of farmland. But we didn't find any differences in terms of the average area owned or the quality of land. So as you can see, by any indicator, there are huge gender gaps. Now, if you look at it regionally, as we expect, South India does better, and especially uh, in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. But even the best performing state, which is Telangana, here, only 32% of landowners are women, and relative to as low as 5.6% in Odisha, which is in Eastern India. Also, we found very little change between 2010 and 2014. Now, Telangana is an interesting outlier, even for South India, and I believe it is attributable especially to the state's chief minister, N.T. Rama Rao, whose policies for empowering women um, made a big difference and also civil society's active implementation of those policies. Now, given that inheritance law reform has increasingly given daughters rights in joint property, this low figure suggests at least two things. Firstly, that we've had rather a poor impact of the 2005 amendment in practice. If the law were effectively implemented, an increasing percentage of daughters would have acquired land and co-owned it with family members. And secondly, that land is likely not held often as joint property. So the potential gain from this legal reform would have been limited. Only 2% of the holdings were co-owned and only in the southern and western states in our, uh, in our analysis. So we then, what we did was we then analyzed gender inequalities using logistic regressions and economists tend to do that. Now this slide uh, gives you only the marginal effects. Um, and what we found was that the probability of men owning land was 48 percentage points greater than for women owning land. And then very interestingly, 
as you can see in the second uh, equation, the probability of widows owning land was 22 percentage points greater than for married or single women. So in our study, widowhood is central to women becoming landowners, despite legal change, which are changes which have favored daughters. So in 2014, 46% of female owners were widows and most of them were elderly widows. In fact, most female owners had acquired their land through their marital families, sometimes via land purchase with husbands rather than from parents. And a male owner, what tends to happen is that the male owner's plots tend to pass to his widow and often also female headship. So we found that 40%, 41% of the female owners were also household heads, even though there were adult sons and daughters in the household. And other studies uh, which have not gone into such detail, but give us a broad idea also support this. So an all India study for 2010-11 found that 56% of female landowners were widows. And again, most women obtained their land from marital families. And then state level studies also confirm that very few women inherited as daughters. Now we must remember that historically in the 12th century Mitakshara and their Abhag legal treatises, the order of heirs was as follows. First came four generations of men, men in the male line of descent. Only in their absence came the widow, then the unmarried daughter, then the married daughter. Now, either getting no land at all or receiving land mostly as aging widows means that most Indian women lack landed assets at a time in their life cycle when ownership would, be, would benefit them and their families the most. So, for instance, as I had noted, the evidence linking women's assets with children's welfare relates especially to mothers of young children. Likewise, it is married women who, are, who would benefit from the noted link between owning land and reduced risk of spousal violence. And our results, I believe, also point to the need to re-examine the central premise underlying some recent studies by economists that assume that simply a legal change can change behavior. Now, these studies treat the pre-2005 reforms of the uh, Hindu Succession Act of 56 in four states. You remember the four states I'd mentioned. They treat this, these changes as quasi natural experiments and use econometric tools to capture the effect of legal change in daughters' rights on girls' education, female suicides, and son preferences. But I believe these results need scrutiny on at least two grounds. Firstly, we don't know to what extent parents are aware of the exact legal change of the state-specific laws, uh, what the change, you know, speci especially because they were so fine-tuned. And secondly, we find little evidence of daughters co-owning land, which is what the legal reforms particularly affected. Now, parental resistance to bequeathing lot, uh, daughters' land also remains strong. So then the question is, why don't daughters inherit? despite all these legal reforms. And I believe there are two um, notable factors um, uh, in particular, social norms and the social legitimacy of claims. Now, um, talking about social norms has now become quite fashionable among us economists, but we need to ask which social norms? The norms that matter most in relation to property, I believe, are marriage norms. So as you can see in these two uh, top maps, in this left map, um, the greener it is, the better. The left map is on village endogamy and uh, the dark green is where women can marry uh, within the village and white where it is forbidden. And light green is where it's mixed. And as you can see in Pakistan, um, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, it is dark green because uh, in predominantly Muslim societies, you are able to marry within the village. The right-hand side maps looks at close kin marriages, um, and uh, this is this means that uh, whether you can marry your cross cousin or uh, uncle niece marriages, and again uh, you find a very similar pattern to the village endogamy norms. Now Hindu ma Hindu families in North India where it's white forbid marriages within the village and to close kin, and both aspects are linked to notions of incest and shared body particles. So you actually cannot marry anybody related to you within several generations through either parent. Daughters here are perforce married to strangers at long distances, and they are seen as belonging to another family. So giving them land is seen as losing the land forever. And here there's strong resistance to giving women land. In South India, 
By contrast, Hindu families do allow village and close kin marriages between cross cousins and say uncle niece. And this potentially help, would help the land remain within the family and the village. It is also easier for women to manage the land. And here there is less resistance to the idea of endowing daughters, although in practice, not many do so. Now, I must emphasize that these are clearly cultural norms and not religious norms because both uh, in North India and South India, we're talking about Hindu families. In mainly Muslim nations, as I'd said, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in village and close kin marriages are allowed, but little, not that much practiced. The second uh, set of norms we should consider are what I call female seclusion norms. And we can think of female seclusion in two ways. Firstly, there's the practice of veiling. And secondly, the gender segregation of public space. Now, both restrict women's mobility and their ability to manage land. Now, among Hindus, veiling is practiced. So I'll give you this, um, uh, this uh, uh, slide. And you can see that among Hindus, veiling is practiced in North India, but not in the South and Northeast India. And here you can see very contrasting pictures. This is Rajasthan in Northwest India. And here you have <coughs> women sitting in a pub and having a meeting in, in South uh, India. And both of, in both cases, uh, they are at meetings. And I, I want to, um, you, to share this particular very interesting uh, picture with you as well, because here you, these are all uh, Hindu women in Northwest India. And you'll notice that one woman is not veiled and the others are. And these are all daughters-in-law in the village and she is the daughter. So the, what the, the point is that these social norms, even of veiling, are extremely intricate and vary a lot within Hindu communities. Among Muslims, veiling is a norm. Um, more generally, but actual adherence against, again varies regional, regionally and by class. But beyond veiling is the gender segregation of public space. And I would like to argue that this is common across many cultures. So in South Asia, for instance, good women are expected to avoid spaces dominated by men, especially village markets and tea shops. Now, these are the spaces where you have informal networking for farm transactions, uh, and this particularly restricts women farmers. But such segregation, I might remind people, uh, was also common in the West, for instance, in England in late 19th century. And those of you who read Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd will recall that Bathsheba Everdeen, the young woman farmer, was extremely discomforted when she first entered the corn market, which was a very male space indeed. So what I'm suggesting is that the idea of gender segregation of space is much more common across cultures than veiling, and, but it restricts women's public interactions unless they have a critical mass. And all the seclusion norms are, of course, declining even in South Asia because more and more women are entering public life. It is difficult to change marriage norms, which are linked to ideas of kinship and incest. Now, beyond social norms is the, con uh, is the idea of the social legitimacy of cl claims. And there are diverse notions about who deserves to inherit your property. And many of you would have particular notions of who would deserve to inherit what property you own. Now, in some cultures, it is the one who performs your last rites, which is, for instance, among Hindus, they favor sons. Blood ties are emphasized in all cultures, but not equally. So some may favor men over women. Then marital ties, many cultures favor widows over other heirs. And this is true, interestingly, even in Europe. And then Proximity of residence is given emphasis in, in commu some communities by implication, the idea is who will look after you in old age. So in fact, in Sri Lanka, daughters who marry outside the village cannot claim land, but if they return on divorce, they get a share. And more generally, one can argue that for land, what can also matter is who is likely to farm it. Now, given um, all these uh, social norms and ideas of legitimacy, how can we better implement gender progressive laws? So for a start, you will say, well, we need awareness campaigns <clears throat> for women, for their families, and especially for the administrative officers who register land uh, inheritance claims. Um, now, women uh, also need support 
to resist pressure to sign away their shares in favor of brothers, as many tend to do um, in, across South Asia. Now, many see brothers as their social security after the parents pass away. Widows, however, tend to keep their land on behalf of themselves and their children, especially their sons. Now, women who wish to legally contest their claims uh, need legal uh, aid and, and guidance. Uh, but few contest this. <clears throat> so I have an ongoing project uh, and I have a research team. We are looking at online high court cases. And we looked at cases from 2005 to 2020 and found only 113 cases across India of a woman co partner filing a case in a trial court or directly in the high court. Of course, the online cases <clears throat> will not cover all the cases, but they are reflective. 67% of these cases were in courts in South and West India. And in most cases, the opposing party was the brother. Now, I know that rural women's groups in India, such as WGWLO, Makam, which is an all India women farmers platform, has been, have been doing gender sensitization training of village uh, uh, administrative officers. They've been doing media awareness campaigns and subjecting uh, cases where daughters sign away their rights to legal scrutiny. I might mention that there are um, women's groups and lawyers in Pakistan also who have been um, very active in this regard. But despite these efforts, family resistance to undying daughters remains strong. So at least in the short run, <clears throat> we need to ask or think of other ways of enhancing women's land rights. Also, I would like to argue that we need to think of a group approach and not just individual access. So what are these other ways? Well, beyond the family um, is the state and the market. Now, state gov uh, the governments in many countries have given direct transfers of land to poor households as part of anti-poverty programs. And now in India, these are given to poor women, either solely or jointly with spouses. But we know that the state has rather limited surplus land. The market is another possibility, but individual women um, uh, farmers lack financial resources. However, the state can support women's access to land markets in different ways. One is via subsidy to purchase land. And the Andhra Pradesh government in the 1980s, in fact, launched a loan come grant scheme to help groups of Dalit women buy land. And 10 of them would get together to buy, let's say, 10 acres and register an acre each in each woman's name. You can also um, uh, support women in land leasing. Kerala and another, uh, some other states, all women's groups are leasing in land. But group, uh, doing it in groups is, is, would be a, gr a big step forward because it can also help women farmers overcome production constraints. So I'm going to illustrate this with the example of Kerala, where I've done uh, more detailed research. Now, in the 2000s, under the state's um, poverty eradication mission of the government of Kerala, Kudumshri, group farming was promoted. And here, women initially joined neighborhood groups for savings and credit. And then those who wish to could pool their resources to lease in land, which they cultivate jointly, and they equitably share labor costs and benefits. They receive some support from the state in terms of a startup grant, technical training, and access to subsidized credit from NABAD, which is the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development. And um, the, uh, there are 68,000 uh, such groups and, and more uh, with uh, involving more than 300,000 women in Kerala. And here you can see a picture of one of these groups uh, operating a partilla. Now, what I wanted to do was to compare uh, the relative performance of all women's group farms and individual family farms. So I um, collected data over 2012 and 14. Um, I did a survey of a sample of 250 farms, which included all women group farms and individual family farms in two districts uh, of Kerala. And we collected weekly data. It was very ambitious. So it was weekly data for all inputs and outputs um, uh, over an entire, entire year um, uh, for every plot and crop. And we also collected qualitative data via focus group discussions. We found that the average size of a group was six. All the members were literate. Many of them had completed secondary school. 
And interestingly, the groups were economically disadvantaged, uh, homogeneous, relatively homogeneously, but they were socially heterogeneous by caste and religion. Now we know that uh, standard collective action theory would argue that uh, homogeneity uh, is important for promoting cooperation. But here we find that actually some degree of social heterogeneity helped in expanding the social capital base of the groups and hence their access to land. Now the groups cultivate about one um, hectare on average, which is uh, three times about three times more than the individual farms, and they lease in land while the individual farmers, 95% of which are male managed, own all or most of the land they cultivate. So we can see that the state support somewhat levels the playing field for women's group, but not versus the male managed group, but not fully because clearly leasing in land uh, leads to high transaction costs. So what, we did, what did we find? What we found was that the annual value of output of group farms was 1.8 times that of individual family farms. Groups did specially well in banana cultivation. And I also calculated the annual returns by deducting the paid out costs and found that the annual net returns per farm, per farm was five times higher than of individual um, largely male managed farms and 1.6 times higher per hectare. Now, uh, some of the groups had uh, even used their profits to purchase land. Now, women as managers had also learned a lot of new technical skills. They had uh, learned the ability to negotiate in multiple markets and they re reported improved status in family and community. And many had stood for, have stood for village uh, council elections and won. So it's improved their status socially as well as politically. Importantly too, group farms did much better than individual family farms in terms of economic survival and food security under COVID when we had a national lockdown in 2020, March, April. So in Kerala, for instance, of the 30,000 group farms which are harvesting under national lockdown, 87% survived economically while large numbers of individual farmers lost out. And in some of the, some other states, uh, group farms have come up uh, in West and, and East India. And uh, here again, uh, they are reporting uh, that they are much more food secure than if they had uh, been uh, doing individual family farming. And many of these groups have come up around 2015 to 18. So then let me, uh, let me conclude that after a century of struggle, women in South Asia have gained significant legal rights in landed property. Now among Hindus in India, daughters who had few rights in the 1930s today have equal rights with sons in a man's separate and joint family property, as well as direct rights by birth in ancestral property, wherever this applies. Hindu women in Nepal also now enjoy equal rights with brothers in their father's property. And Muslim women have strong but unequal rights across South Asia. In practice, however, gender inequality in land ownership remains high across all countries by multiple indicators. And in India, the women most likely to own land are older widows whose claims continue to enjoy much more social legitimacy than that of daughters. So on this count, not much has changed over this last century. And one might even argue possibly since the 12th century when the Mitakshra legal treatise also favored widows over daughters. But for monitoring the impact of inheritance law reform, as emphasized in SDG 5, we need to collect data that captures the specifics of the legal reforms. And, uh, and none, none have done so thus far. Also for enhancing women's access to land in, uh, in practice, I believe we need to go beyond inheritance and frame state policies which improve women's market access to land um, uh, through lease or purchase. And this market access is likely to improve if women acquire and cultivate land in groups. Now, existing examples of group farming uh, and by all women's groups by several regions in India demonstrate that this can not only improve women's land access and productivity, but it can also empower them socially and politically. Of course, we know that leasing in land cannot bridge in itself gender gaps in ownership but we could think of it as an interim way forward. 
And as the example of Kerala Telangana shows, government policy can make a big difference if it is supported at the highest level, for instance, at the level of the chief ministers. Yet the basic question does remain, when will there be gender equality in land ownership in practice? How can we help legal reforms trump disabling social norms? So thank you. You know, thanks for a very fascinating annual lecture. You make the very important argument that uh, legal reforms are necessary, but by no means sufficient in bringing about equality in land ownership, land rights for women versus men, especially in societies which have entrenched social norms. But I think it's also interesting, and we can pick it up in the Q and A, that there are practical steps one can take, both by the state and civil society, to address these norms and to bring about equality of access to land for both for women versus men. I would like to turn now to the discussant, Sakigo Fukudapar, who's going to provide comments on your very interesting annual lecture for about 10 minutes or so. Sakigo, over to you. Thank you. Sakigo, I can't mute. hear you. I'm mute. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so thank you, uh, Kunal, for the invitation to serve as a discussant to uh, this wonderful lecture. I mean, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, as well as an honor. Um, um, I must say I'm one of the admirers of uh, Bina's um, work, particularly um, uh, because I myself am very uh, interested in rural issues. I, for many years in the early part of my career, I worked on rural development and the issues of food security. Um, and Bina's pioneering work in this field is very well known. Um, her 1994 award-winning book is a sort of a, a seminal work on this uh, on this issue on these issues of of land um, and land ownership as a, a driving factor for women's autonomy, agency, and um, em empowerment, as well as for as a as a as a factor behind the um, improvements in other aspects of development, such as um, uh, education and health, um, um, reduction in um, violence, um, and so forth, as well as productivity efficiency. Um, and you know, the, the, her scholarship is has been widely noted and recognized for, particularly for the rigor of the empirical analysis. Um, and um, the cross-disciplinary approach that she takes that effectively, very effectively combines historical, legal, and anthropological um, methods and um, sources. Um, and I, I personally find that there are two things that are most admirable uh, in her work. The first is that it is very much rooted in an understanding of the realities of women's lives. Um, and that is because she does such detailed field work, um, really talking to people, you know. And uh, th this is, in a sense, it's a bit of a sad commentary because it's it's in such a far cry. It stands in such contrast from so much of what we read these days, which, uh, in fact, is kind of a laboratory analysis of data. The second thing that is um, uh, that is so admirable is that she, it is driven by a clear motivation uh, in, a, in a search for women's emancipation and empowerment. Um, and um, so her, she is bringing the analytical power of um, scholarly research to um, identify the key obstacles as we have so, so, so clearly heard in, in her, in her lecture, um, but I, I'd like to point out that you know it's because she doesn't just stop at publishing papers and being a scholar, but also she enters into the fray of uh, activism for change, as you've heard, uh, speaking to ministers and so forth. Now I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Um, first, um, you know, Bina, in your analysis of um, uh, of, of women's rights, land land rights um, in 1994, you have a last chapter that is says, that is has a title, The Long March Ahead, right? And that was in 1994. So 
thinking about this journey from 1994 to 2021, how do you contrast, you know, your 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 thinking um, in 1994 compared with your thinking today? I mean, are you more optimistic? Are you surprised by the progress? Are you surprised by the obstacles that have cropped up? Um, so share with us a little bit the trajectory of your own thinking about where you have been surprised, where you have changed your mind, whether you have had the right kind of pre the, the the you have predicted what was going to 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 come out um the the second thing is about the social norms and the legitimacy of social norms and i and i think it's very interesting it's really fascinating the way that you have looked at um um <clears throat> the norms of seclusion and and marriage um uh, to identify some of these norms that are actually getting in the way and, of course, the legitimacy of norms as well. But then I wonder to what extent these norms are reinforcing economic interests and power hierarchies within households and within the community. Because, you know, I wonder, for example, that if you have a society where women are... Um, marrying within the household and as i think you point this out as and within the community and the village then they're not going to be moving away and the family as an economic enterprise so to speak does not lose the property because it stays kind of within the families so to speak i mean are these economic interests um playing in here and is that's what's sort of really driving it not just kind of adherence to norms i mean i, I think the trouble with this thing called social norms is, is this nebulous <clears throat> thing, sort of think that it exists but actually you know norms are changing all the time social norms evolve cultural values evolve and they're also not uh monolithic in a sense that in a country like india you have incredible diversity of norms right but then you have this constant of um and nonetheless a constant um uh, obstacle that can be somehow attributed to these social norm factors um and, and you know obviously the power relations within households and um, community makes a difference to how these social norms change and where, when, whether the legitimacy of norms also evolve. Um, so the, the third thing is about these um, government policies. I mean, okay, obviously there is legal reform and there are social norms, but in between there are, as, as you have already pointed out, um, the factor of government um, policy and government action. And you've pointed out the importance of political leadership um, uh, in certain um, states that is lacking in other states that has made a difference. Also the importance <coughs> of society um, activism. And, you know, could you say a little bit more about the, the details of uh, what, what those mechanisms are? Um, but before I finish, I, I want to make another set of comments about um, uh, the importance of Bina's lecture um, that goes beyond um, the topics that she has discussed. That is that, you know, wider annual lectures, I think, are very significant there because they are kind of a marker in the direction that the field of development economics research is going. And, and I think that Bina's work points to very important directions uh, in the field. And, and that is number one, as I had already mentioned, the importance of multidisciplinary analysis that draws on historical, ethnographic, legal, um, uh, and anthropological sources and methods. Um, and I think we need more of that in development economics research. The, the second thing is the role of uh, research and the political alliances that are made between researchers and activists and politicians in actually bringing about change. And, and I think this is something that 
that has been observed in other um, efforts, particularly uh, written up in India about you know what led to like the, this legislation like, such as uh, right to uh, right to food bill and and things of that kind, where um, you know intellectuals play a very important role in bringing the evidence-based research necessary um, for uh, the kind of uh, policy change arguments that uh, need to be made. And, and I think um, uh, this, you know, when we think about how economics can be more relevant, I think this is um, one of the elements that we need to sort of think about how um, uh, scholars as can also become more involved in building alliances with um, social activists and political um, actors. Um, and finally, I really want to applaud this lecture because this is a, I think this is the first uh, uh, lecture in feminist economics. Um, I looked at the list of wonderful speakers uh, <laughs> that you have had in uh, giving the annual lecture. And uh, this is indeed, I think, the first one that falls in the domain of feminist economics. Uh, and I actually also looked at your uh, publications list. Uh, it is an incredibly rich list of publications that um, uh, WIDA um, has produced. Um, and, and just looking at the first 300, <laughs> all in 2021, uh, is very impressive, but I could find only 16 um, articles or books that, titles that had the term gender in it. So obviously this is some, not in the sort of the, the mainstream, uh, and most of the titles had to do with labor markets and uh, wage outcomes. Um, but, um, and so, so wider is no different from other, um, research organizations. Um, feminist economics remains marginalized as a subfield of um, economics despite its um, importance, not only just because women, you know, are um, half of the population or more than half the population, um, and not only because there are disparities in outcomes. Um, disparities in outcomes, such as in land ownership, of course, is terribly important, but as we have seen from uh, Bina's lecture, um, these outcomes are inherently related to the, um, the workings of the economy. Um, and, um, and as Bina ha has shown, you know, it does affect productivity, it does affect efficiency, it does affect um, uh, social progress, um, and and so on in multiple ways, and um, moreover, this is a subdiscipline, feminist economics, that has much to offer in terms of conceptual frameworks, theories, methodology, and epistemology in general. And as Marilyn Power wrote in a seminal 2004 article, "Social Provisioning as a Starting Point for Feminist Economics," uh, there are perhaps five unique features that characterizes subfield um, that is use of well-being as a measure of economic success, uh, inclusion of ethical goals and values and as, as an intrinsic part of the analysis, um, analysis of social, economic and political processes with power relations as a fundamental feature, and interrogation of differences by race, class, ethnicity, and finally, the incorporation of caring and unpaid labor as fundamental economic activities that effectively redefines the boundaries of what we mean by the economy. And, and, and I think it kind of um, takes economics out of this sort of pretense that economics is a science, a sort of, sort of a laboratory activity um, where we're trying to discover truth, but that economics has to be thought of as part of a process of uh, promoting um, social change for, um, for a better world. And I think, you know, Bina's lecture was a, a great illustration of all of these things. And so, you know, feminist economics has much to offer on a wide range of topics that go beyond the, prop the, uh, the ownership of land. And I would um, 
look forward to, you know, much more um, work um, at wider as elsewhere on um, uh, gender as a dimension in multiple areas from macroeconomics to, to uh, other issues. So thank you very much. Uh, I can I address a few, spend five minutes just on no, a few? I just want to give you the opportunity, but I just want to respond quickly to Saki because very interesting. I will do. I will do. Yeah. You are right, Saki, this is the first feminist economics annual lecture. Absolutely. <laughs> a good way to mark our silver anniversary, but also the point that you made, which is absolutely right, that feminist economics is still at the, the margins of development economics or modern development economics, uh, especially because feminist economics brings in other, other disciplines. Anthropology, of course, has been our work itself. And, and, and sociology and so on. Uh, and in modern economic development is quite single discipline focused, as we know. So I think, or, or fairly, fairly narrow. So I think it's, that's a very interesting observation too, and thank you for that. Uh, Bina, do you want to uh, respond? Yes, uh, yes. I'll, be, I'll be brief because uh, Sakiko, firstly, thank you very much for those very um, uh, complimentary words and, and raising a number of issues, which I think are very important. Um, but I'll, it, it, I want to first make a plug on the last point, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, this, of course, issues of land uh, um, and gender uh, is not only about feminist economics, it's about, it's central to agricultural economics. Economics, uh, and it's central to the whole way in which we think of uh, development in terms of the transition, agrarian transitions from agriculture to industry or rural to urban, uh, and 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 that's where the feminization of agriculture comes in. So let's let's accept this as a much broader um, <clears throat> uh, terrain, uh, which is why you find that when a field of one's own came out. I had many comments by uh, economists who worked on land reform to say, you've opened up a pathway to a new channel for land reform. So they claimed it. It wasn't just the, uh, the feminist groups of, who, of course, did, uh, did claim it. Um, I, um, I also want to mention that I, there isn't actually enough work on this. So although there's the predominant amount of feminist economics work is on, um, on labor markets. And uh, the starting point of my book, 1994, was that uh, women's economic status depends centrally on the inequality in ownership of uh, immovable property, especially land. And uh, the, the remarkable thing is that while we have a lot of work by male economists who don't on inequality, which is now much defeated, um, it, it, it doesn't provide a gender analysis, uh, you know, stuff that I really um, admire. I mean, there's Piketty's wonderful book and there's um, Milanovic's work and so on. So I think we, we want more of this, um, more focus on this is what I'm saying um, as well. Uh, from looking from 1994 onwards, the long march ahead, yes, um, there were two aspects. One was the legal aspect because I had pointed out in 1994, um, the kinds of inequalities in laws which existed and it required primary data, Sakiko, not primary data, it required me to understand the law. So I spent months in the Supreme Court library um, looking at the laws and, and understanding the intricacies of, of land laws, which varied by state and religion across South Asia, five countries of South Asia. Um, and uh, so I had, expected that we could move forward in law. But in 1994 itself, I said, we don't have enough land in developing economies to distribute land to everybody. And we should think of a group approach. So what I've been working now after so many decades, looking at a group approach, the, the kernel of that was already there in, in the last chapter of 1994, if, you, you know, if somebody wants to re revisit that. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of social norms uh, is much discussed. And I think there are certain norms which don't change and other norms which change. So female mm -hmm. seclusion will vanish, you know, over time uh, with urbanization, with other jobs and so on, and more and more women in public life across um, uh, countries. But uh, the uh, marriage norms are related to ideas of incest and there are issues of taboos. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that 
having them, have, not having those norms, women shouldn't get access to land. But I'm saying it uh, it, uh, it it reduces the um, uh, the ways in which parents, uh, at least rural parents, think about um, a land and where no family wants to lose their land, typically. And here, what is interesting in my most recent research of 2021 uh, paper, the results of which I shared, was that even when there were sons and daughters were both there in the families where the widows inherited, uh, it, the older widows did. So I asked myself, why is this the case? And older men did. One was that they are the ones who wanted to farm. And the children wanted to leave, educated children wanted to leave and find other jobs. So there's a different kind of transition, um, which is also taking place. So I don't expect marriage norms to change, but there are mm -hmm. other factors which which could happen, which could reduce the the centrality of that, which we see today. Uh, the the third um, uh, issue is uh, that you that you talked about um, was that. Um, you know, yes, the, the collaboration between civil society and intellectuals is very important. Um, I've done it for, um, you know, most of my uh, career. In fact, the uh, 2005 uh, campaign for civil society campaign for, Hindu, for amending the Hindu Succession Act um, was a big collaboration, uh, you know, when I, I catalyzed it, but there was a huge collaboration across India with civil society um, groups. And I carry my research to, um, to civil society. So for instance, after my book came out, I, I held workshops um, in India, uh, all India workshops, in regional workshops, and also talked to parliamentarians in Nepal. Um, and um, I did it proactively to some extent, also was invited. And it led to the setting up of, an, of networks. So for instance, WGWLO um, and some of my colleagues there will be here, uh, was something that was initiated after a workshop that I did. And then writing in other forums, pamphlets, um, newspapers to share your research. So I do that on a regular basis. And, and I think that builds the bridge with policymakers as well, apart from direct interventions in policy. So I think that's, that's a very important point uh, that uh, the impact of research depends not just on what you do and in academic journals, which is very important, but that you have to take those ideas forward in other forums as well. So I'll, um, you raised many other questions, but I will leave it at that. And there are uh, lots of questions coming in um, on the chat. Uh, so Kunal, with your uh, uh, indulgence, uh, would you like me to pick up two or three of those that I've already read? Uh, and... You could, but I was also wondering, I, there are not all the questions still appeared on and where you, uh, where you can no, see. So, so you're doing it three at a time, you would say. So I'll pick up the first three. And, uh, uh, what, I'm suggesting, what I might do, Vin, if that's okay with you, there are a set of questions which are not yet visible for you, which are very okay. relevant uh, on social norms. So I shall start with the question by Nancy Falber, who's her, oh, okay. uh, Nancy Connors herself. So Nancy, yes, hi, Nancy. so Nancy asks a really interesting question. Um, let me just try and find it. So, uh, so big question. How does analysis of land rights fit into a larger picture of patriarchal institutions? This also relates to Sakiko's comments on power interest in both the state and the family. So, uh, so how does this question of land rights fit in the overall analysis of patriarchal institutions? That's uh, that's Nancy's question. Uh, there's also a question here, which is around the, the uh, an observation for somebody working on Pakistan, uh, Farid the Shahid, who says that women might get rights to land, but often pass those, la those rights of the land to sons in, the in their own sons in the family. So effectively counterbalancing anything that might happen to actually giving women land, access to land. So how does one deal with that? Um, and uh, and there's also a question here um, from Simone Scott. Let me read that question out to you and I can, if I can find it because there's so many questions on the chat. So the question from Simone is, are there best practice examples of legal reforms be supplemented by interventions designed to increase communities' awareness of women's rights to land and women's ability to exercise this rights to land. So are there examples of where legal reforms can be supplemented by other interventions around community awareness? And for example, your, your discussion of civil society interventions. So let's start with this three question. That's okay. 
Yeah, they are very uh, wide-ranging questions. Hi, everybody. Nancy, Farida, um, nice to nice to have you here. Um, you know, I think yeah, that is one question by Sakiko. I didn't take up, which is, um, and it depends on what patriarchal institutions we're talking about. But let's take the family as the center core of a patriarchal institution. Now, uh, Sakiko, you seem to imply that if women marry within the same village and the family continues to exercise control over the land, um, does it not strengthen, it's because of economic reason, does it not strengthen, um, keep the family strong rather than the woman? Um, and uh, I, think, uh, I think it's much more complex than that. Um, so, um, if you actually look at the ethnography, and really the economists must read much more uh, ethnographic evidence, uh, you find, uh, for instance, um, and I, I read, when I was doing a field of unsown, I read everything I could lay my hand on in microfiche, published, unpublished, dissertations by doctoral students, um, and so on. And what you find is that if a woman is married in the same village, it makes a big difference to her to, um, in, in a positive way. So for instance, in, in her negotiations with her husband, one of the, one of the remarks I remember in, in this ethnography was, every time she quarrels, uh, the husband was being interviewed, every time she quarrels with me, I can't say very much because she'll run off to her mother. Remember, these are very young brides. So if you compare that to a 15, 16 year old in Northwest India, who's married at long distances, to a completely strange family. She is completely embedded in patriarchy of not one generation, but remember these are extended families sometimes of two or three generations within a village. And, and here what she has is that her ability to actually be within the same village enables her to negotiate better within a marital family because she has the fallback option of a parental family. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think uh, if you look at the the issue, the it within the bargaining framework about which I have also written uh, written quite a lot, that you can bargain over social norms, but also the within the bargaining context, it depends on what your exit options are. Mm -hmm. That will make a difference to your bargaining outcomes within the within the within the family. Mm -hmm. And this is also what you find in my in the work I did with a colleague on domestic violence. Um, what we it was actually I believe one of the first papers to look at whether women's women owning property reduced the incidence of domestic violence and it made a huge difference and the the reason was that um, it reduced violence because her husband knew that she had a credible exit option which if you only have a job you don't because where can you go with three children in the middle of the night. And so we found this both in the statistical analysis, we control for everything else that you could, you could think of. Uh, and in the, in the perceptions of the women, this provided a very important um, fallback. So this I'm saying more than patriarchal norms, but if you take the village endogamy cross cousin marriage norm, in practice, of course, village endogamy is often practiced in the South, but in practice, uh, uh, cousin marriages are not anymore as much. Mm -hmm. So that that is that is declining because of the understanding of medical science and you know and, and so on. So there's much more to be talked about, but let me move to the other two very interesting questions. Um, so uh, Farida, you're right that uh, I did find it uh, even in the field of unsown that if women had land, they often um, if you ask them who will who will you give it to after you? And they would say, well, um, um, uh, probably my son rather than uh, the daughter. We need to ask, of course, and you know as well as I, why is it the case? Because sons, according to her, provide her much better support um, because of the social construct of inequalities outside the home. So a son can go and work and provide an income, which a daughter may not. So inequalities outside the family, which reduce women's um, uh, which which, which reduce women's ability to work in the labor market for instance will make a difference uh, to um, you know, the the security that the mother feels vis-a-vis -vis the son or daughter what is interesting however is that there are some studies there's a study in an urban uh, south india where um, uh, property is now being left uh, to those who care for you 
And so there are there are examples where there's a recognition that daughters are the ones who care for you. So I think, again, uh, this richness of ethnography will reveal that there are uh, cracks in this uh, in this understanding and where women also might be changing. Remember this, uh, you know, this was several decades uh, a while ago. And today, I think women are much more willing to keep the land uh, for themselves and have if, if there are daughters in the family, then they might be able to cultivated with the daughters, subject to the daughters living in the same village. So I think uh, the proximity issue remains a, a very important, uh, very important one. The, um, the legal, I didn't quite get the, uh, the third question on legal reform with other interests, I, um, Kunal. Um, there was- That there, that right, is right in front of you. I think you could see the question. Oh, yes. Uh, so best practices of legal reform being supplemented by interventions. Um, and so I gave you examples. I know of examples in India, for instance, where uh, you have uh, the Makam is a Mahila Kisan. It's a platform across India. It's a network. Uh, and then there are there are regional groups like uh, the women's group for, for land, uh, uh, the working group for uh, women's land ownership uh, who are doing work on awareness raising and who are doing work on gender sensitizing of, of people who actually uh, write down the uh, clauses. Um, there's also been a pushback that women, women signing away their shares in favor of brothers should not be taken um, as, as acceptable and that it should be subject to legal scrutiny. So that's happening in India. It's also happening in Pakistan. I, somebody just sent me an article, a friend sent an article today to, to do that. But it seems that it's not enough. Because if you look at the, the slide I showed you of what percent of women own land or what proportion of total landowners are women, the proportion is very small. In India, uh, you know, in this across nine states, it's only on average 14%. Uh, however, the differences in states, like in Telangana, it's 32%, shows that uh, policymakers can make a difference if they're pushed at the highest level in terms of implementation, because a lot of this implementation is being done, um, you know, uh, by administration uh, down the line to the lowest uh, lowest level. Um, so I'm still optimistic. I was optimistic when I uh, said a long road ahead. And I'm still optimistic that uh, once this data comes out, once we recognize where the, where the obstacles are, perhaps we could move in new directions. I believe we need to move towards group approaches. Um, uh, and and I think that could provide us the critical, you know, the, the it would it would empower women. Um, I might add, uh, going back to the first question by Nancy Sekiko, that the group farms that I was talking about are outside the family, so these women are um, not embedded, providing unpaid labor on family farms. They actually form a group outside the family. They learn new skills and they gain new knowledge. And they say that uh, now, uh, now other farmers, male farmers are asking us, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to share some of the knowledge that, we, that we, we've gained because we've got this training. Uh, and they, they feel that uh, power dynamics within the family has changed. So some FAO and other, you know, many organizations have been pushing family farms and reform of family farms. But I feel as long as women are embedded within the family farm, it's very difficult for them to actually gain the autonomy uh, that these other groups can. And it has not led to more conflict in the family. In fact, husbands are supportive. So if a woman is unable to join the group, she can provide substitute labor. Usually it's another woman, but sometimes it's also the husband who, who, who comes in because they see it as additional supplementary income for the family. Um, so, um, the, the, the two questions on tenancy, uh, Kunal, by Haroon, Akram, Lodi, and Farida. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, first, uh, Farida, yes, I've, uh, as a follow up on this, I've just, I have a working paper which has just come out a couple of months ago where I look at these households um, uh, and see does ownership of land. Um, you know, you look at male owners and female owners, and in those households where women owning uh, own the land, uh, I asked, well, that, is there a difference in productivity? And the second is, um, do they lease out the land 
I mean, who leases out the land more? And I found that there wasn't controlling for other factors, uh, any statistically significant difference in productivity between um, households where the woman was the owner and households where the man was the owner. Uh, uh, and But what was interesting is that women were significantly more likely to lease out uh, the land rather than self-cultivate. And that goes to the heart of other constraints that women face. Um, so for instance, uh, the, the constraint of uh, inadequacy of, of uh, adult labor in the home. And, and I, I think, I believe it's, it's the, so, so that, is, uh, that is extremely important. Uh, and, the, and it's something that you can do in terms of state policy. Uh, the data, Haroon has talked about data, Sub-Saharan Africa, there have been studies, and mostly it has been on, you're right, on women managing farms, a few studies uh, on uh, ownership, uh, but you don't, uh, that is not enough. You do need data on ownership. And in South Asia, um, there's, uh, there's very little work, even on managing uh, farms. So for instance, there's one uh, paper uh, of a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Kanika Mahajan, who's who's uh, who's looked at managers, but she's not looked at been able because of the lack of data on on whether ownership makes a difference to productivity, and that's what I try and do in this uh, GDI working paper. Uh, so we do have huge uh, journeys to travel to persuade. Uh, the uh, gender disaggregation of data, including the land uh, digitization records, which is ongoing um, in uh, in India and other, in, in other countries. Thanks, Pina. I was wondering, Sakiko, if you had any observation on Nancy Falbris uh, co comment on, on patriarchal institutions and how do you see exactly land rights and land ownership within the broader context of patri uh, patriarchal institutions? How, how do you see the the question that Nancy is asking is what what exactly are women's land rights? How how's that how is that how would one see that within a, a bigger picture of patriarchy? Is there something that you see is part of patriarchal institution itself, or do you think there are ways to to see it as independent of patriarchal institutions? So you you have to unmute yourself. I think this is the problem. It's it's both, you know. I mean, it's a product of patriarchal institutions, and it's also. A, um, but I I think the the question is how you how you you get at it to overturn these these norms because you know inheritance laws do change and they they're not. I, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, in my own country in Japan, where. Um, there was an overnight shift in inheritance laws, and um, then it's implemented. There, there was no objection, if you know what I mean. There wasn't this kind of a huge hurdle. Um, so, I mean, I think it's it's all very much contextual, uh, and I think Bina explained all of that. I mean, all of those different kind of societal context. But, but I also think that there are these, you know, economic factors that go into that, that dynamic. Anyway, um, I, I think I'll just leave it there. Thanks, Sakiko. Uh, Beatrice, uh, there are a bunch of questions around yes. uh, the difference of land ownership by caste, religion, there's a question of Ira Gang on religion, question about Asha Ramishan, caste and class. Would you have any response to those questions and comments? Yeah, there's some very quick um, responses to one or two that I've been able to read. The writing is very small. Uh, firstly, yes, uh, in uh, across South Asia, um, uh, the laws uh, in, of inheritance differ by religion uh, and uh, and or particularly for land. Uh, so in India, the laws are different for Hindus, Christians, Parsis, and Muslim communities. Um, uh, but because it's predominantly Hindu, so one can say that uh, and Sikhs and Jains are included in that, that 83%, any change in Hindu law uh, benefits a very large number. But we still need reform of uh, uh, Muslim law, which has happened in Pakistan, for instance. Um, we still uh, are subject to the 1937 uh, Sharia Act. Um, but also there are tribal communities, there are regions which have not been codified. So there is some way to go. Um, the uh, the second is there was somebody asked us why there can be a why 
uh, uh, there can be a backlash of violence against women if there's property. I This is a question which constantly comes to me. And I say there's violence relating to property irrespective of whether it's women or men. So you, you have conflicts over property between brothers and there's huge amounts of evidence on that. Um, in, in the case of the widows, um, I didn't, uh, I have not come across cases where the, uh, there was violence against uh, widows inheriting. Um, in, uh, but um, the, the, if, if there, are, there could be examples, um, I'm not disputing that, uh, but it, it doesn't seem to be a widespread phenomenon, simply that, that daughters are not given the land you know, for a start. So there are other ways of, of, of preventing that. Now, what is what is interesting for me, and this is completely anecdotal, that after um, 2005, you know, I'd written an article in the Hindu because the Hindu, the newspaper had asked me, can you explain to us what is the change? So I'd written this piece. And after that, a lot of strange, strange people I didn't know would write to me saying, Professor Agarwal, this is our family. This is our family history. Do you think uh, that my mother or my uh, sister has a claim or my wife has a claim. So that I found very interesting that men were taking an interest. Uh, and uh, in, I usually would say that, look, I, I'm not a lawyer, but this is my interpretation of the law. Uh, in a couple of cases, they wrote back saying that they had won the case and in other cases they had not. Um, so uh, the uh, so uh, yes, men have an interest because women have uh, copartnery rights. Uh, but as you can see, uh, it's uh, very very little property is seems to be held as copartnery in terms of land. And I think we need we don't have enough data right now to be, see whether this varies a lot lot across across states. We found that it was mainly in South and West India. I um, I can't read uh, all these. Um, uh, yes, Kunal, did you? I want think to well, just well, guide well, me? question that I noticed, which I might be quite relevant to conclude the lecture with, which is that how how general are the, your arguments that legal reforms that do not trump social norms? So, in other words, we have seen legal reforms in other parts of the of the global south. So. To what extent do you think this argument that we don't seem to see little reforms trumping social norms carry over to say sub Saharan Africa? Well, I have I didn't show the slide today. I use it for my teaching all the time, and you find that it's not the case. You find huge inequalities. Uh, uh, Cheryl Doss has done work on it, uh, and you. You, you have huge inequalities. I think there was some 5% of, uh, in one of the um, uh, sub-Saharan African countries, 5% of registered landowners were women. Uh, and similarly in Latin America. So in, in Latin America, in fact, uh, has uh, doesn't suffer from the same complexity of social norms that South Asia does. And at the same time, you do find huge inequalities in ownership of land. So Carmen Diana Deere has written a great deal about it. And so it's, it's um, uh, Kunal, it's much more global across the global south. And you also find very interestingly, um, we don't again have enough data because remember, you know, Piketty, when I wrote to him and I asked him, uh, you know, does he have gendered analysis? He said he didn't have enough data um, on that count. Is that in the West, uh, there have been attempts to um, assess this in the United States and UK. The gaps are much less, but there you're talking about like pension incomes, uh, you know, uh, uh, lifetime earnings, um, and uh, but there are gender gaps there as well. Uh, and if you there, it links with the issue of the labor market. So if you're not acquiring land, uh, you know, not, not like acquiring property simply through the uh, through inheritance systems, but you're acquiring it through the market, then uh, your financial status matters. Your ability to purchase a house or land um, or, or immovable property depends on your savings. And so there are huge inequalities of gender wage gaps and, 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 and unequal earnings. Then that could be that would play out also in women's accumulation of of, of, of assets um, over time in, in, the, in the global north. Um, and uh, and uh, the uh, I would like to know whether some of my ideas about group ownership, how they would play out uh, glo more globally. So for instance, I've been arguing not just about land, but urban property. Suppose you have a house 
And we always think of um, women individually, can they afford it or not? And most women can't. But what if six women got together and said, okay, we're going to buy this piece of um, uh, property. We have six rooms and a common space uh, and we'll jointly own it. Is that a possibility? And that has implications uh, uh, also for the way in which we register property. Uh, it also uh, has uh, it relates to architectural design of you know what kinds of uh, property are available in urban context. Let's say in in Delhi or in Mumbai, um, and um, or why is it that we have so few bed sits in uh, in apartment blocks in Delhi, for instance? Um, so sometimes I joke and say, well, parents, when they are, when a daughter is getting married, the best gift he could give, or the parents could give is give her a key to a bed sit instead of spending twice as or three times as much in, uh, you know, in, in, in the wedding ceremony and give it to her. And it's somewhere that she, she has an exit option. Thank you, Bina. Um, unfortunately, we have to bring this annual lecture to a close because you're out of time. So I want to thank you for a fascinating annual lecture, which really provoked so many comments. We unfortunately couldn't go through all of them, uh, but they were really, really good comments from the audience. And thank you, Sakuko, for an excellent discussion and comments and really providing, uh, adding your own, your own interpretation, your own views on exactly how we should look at the question of human rights uh, and uh, linked to the, to the link question of land rights. Uh, I'd like to thank Ruby Richardson and the comms and project team in WIDER for the effort they put in organizing the annual lecture. And I want to thank Jarno and team in uni.fi, the company that they, uh, they, they run, for a superb web platform for the lecture. It's been a, it's a, the, this particular platform which we used in our annual conference earlier this year is absolutely superb. And I want to thank the audience for the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all your questions, but hopefully uh, you did get a lot of uh, insights and answers from been an, as a kicker to your, to your many different, very many questions. I want to actually end up by, as we mentioned about Wider's work on gender, we do have a major project in women's work. I mean, not all the papers are out on our website as yet. Um, there's a special issue of what they're looking coming out uh, next, early next year. And we also have work, which, you know, which I think Bina's aware of, of looking at gender and land rights in Tanzania. It's a very different context, of course, than, than India. And of course, those papers that we're doing on this, on, on this particular project will come on our website at some point soon. So do look out for that uh, in the next uh, next couple of months. I just want to end by saying that those of you are newcomers to a wider event, and I know many of you are uh, in this annual lecture, please do sign up for our newsletter so that you're aware of the work we're doing uh, on, on, on gender, but, over, uh, but more broadly on, on economic development, social development, and political development. So do sign up for our newsletters. That's how we can keep in touch with what the work we are doing uh, in UniWider. And finally, I hope to see all of you in a future UniWider event. And goodbye, and thank you so much for attending this annual lecture. And thank you, Bina, and thank you, Sakhi. Yeah. Thank you, Kunal. I put my email address in the chat. If anybody, you know, I know I couldn't answer your questions, but I'm passionately interested in the topic. So I'd be happy to try and answer some questions if you write to me. Absolutely. Let me just put it and, and thank you, Kunal. Thank you, Sakiko. And thank you, Ruby and her team for organizing this. And it's a great honor to deliver it today. Thank you. Thank you, Bina. Bye-bye.